At one time, all glass was uh, created by males. Uh, females were just not allowed to uh, be involved. And this was in the factory settings, goes back hundreds of years. In 1971, when we opened Habitat Galleries, we uh, had an exhibition of uh, artists from the United States. And in that exhibition, there was two artists that were females. Uh, and uh, one was uh, doing just very small work, as most women were doing at that time. And the other one was Audrey Handler, who was using mixed media, wood and metal and glass, and developing some scale with her work. And, uh, but that, that was it. But just a few years later, through the 70s into the early 80s, then in the same exhibition, there were 25 women. And now uh, women have kept progressing, and I don't know what percentage of the uh, artists working in glass are women, but to give you some statistics, I was in Australia, and I was particularly interested because there were a lot of women artists coming from there. And I found there was uh, teaching facilities in Canberra and Melbourne, and they had 40 students uh, that worked in glass. 30 were women. In, in Japan, you see these uh, artists that are coming out uh, working with glass. And although there are some men involved, they are predominantly women artists. And the same, well, even in Macho, Italy, where uh, you wouldn't expect women to have uh, that much of a, um, an influence because the males are, are fairly dominant just by culture. <laughs> and so consequently, they, um, there's now quite a few women working uh, in, in that area too. So, it's a little dark. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm putting forth three reasons for this growth in women working with uh, glass. And this will be very interesting because the panel may start beating me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one is there were technological advancements and this allowed people to um, uh, work in larger scales. And secondly, uh, there were a, a lot of technical advancements. And suddenly, in that first show, which was all blown glass, now people were casting, slumping, fusing, using lamp work or working over a torch. And so consequently, there was a variety of ways <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> under, uh, under <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There is a variety of ways to uh, work with glass. And the third reason I think is very interesting and, and hardly ever been explored, and that is, it just became louder, uh, and that is um, when this all started in 1962 with Harvey Littleton, when he was asked what makes this studio glass different from the factory glass or all glass that's made. Well, coming up with reasons, one of me said, because we have the idea, we do the work, and, you know, we, are, we carry it right on through, alone in our studios, just like all other artists. Well, that, that actually was pretty difficult because if you were diminutive in size, you weren't able to maybe work as well with um, larger pieces. And also in, 19, in the early 70s, Dale Chihuly was teaching a course, I don't know if any of you know this, he was teaching a course at Penland. And the director, who was really a very fine gentleman, but Bill Brown, came in and said, don't listen to this man, he doesn't make his own work. And so you can see the type of prejudices but once they were eliminated, then all of a sudden, um, any person uh, could work with somebody else or a team of people and make much more significant work. So I wanted to have each of the panelists uh, uh, talk a little bit about how they got involved in glass 
a little bit about their backgrounds. This is Marlena Rose, and this is um, uh, Susan Taylor Glasgow, and then we have Shelly Allen and Jenny Pullman, and all of these artists are in the, uh, in the show that was organized by, uh, really by Aaron. So um, the first question I had, <laughs> the first question I have, and then I'm sitting down, is that uh, uh, what um, do you do you think that there's a difference between work that's made by male artists as opposed to female artists? And I will hand the microphone over to whoever would like to address that first. Okay, so um, I was studying um, art at Tulane University and I was getting my Bachelor of Fine Arts and you have to decide if what, what medium you want to focus in your, your study. So I liked pretty much everything. I painted, um, sculpture, um, really everything. But what I really knew was that I was not interested in glass. <laughs> that was the thing I was for sure not doing because in the 80s, this is when I was in school, um, it was, in my opinion, glass blowing mostly. And so I, I just wasn't interested in learning glass blowing. So I definitely wasn't interested in the glass class. Um, and so eventually I thought, well, I guess I'll try it. You know, I ha I've done everything else. And um, to my surprise, Gene Koss, who's the professor, was teaching in a very um, unique way for the time. He was more interested in sculpture. So he said, I'm going to teach you how to glass blow and then we're gonna, you know, use this wondrous material to communicate an idea. So I thought, wow, this, this, he's speaking my language and I've never looked back. <laughs> Got my own. Okay. <laughs> I, I enjoyed the, your last comment about um, expressing an idea, which I think might be a little, um, I guess, unique to how women work, is, you know, expressing an emotion. And so I'm Susan Taylor Glasgow. I have a studio in Columbia, Missouri, and I'm self-taught in glass. And um, I had a friend who had a kiln next door and he melted some stuff. And um, eventually I applied for workshops at um, Pilchuck and uh, Penland and was awarded uh, residencies at both places. And until that moment, I didn't realize that you could um, go to college for glass. I was not aware of that phenomena. So it was really a wonderful opportunity, especially up at Pilchuck, to um, work with other emerging artists that had academic training. So um, I, I felt like that was a huge springboard to my, um, I guess, my mental understanding, my mental, um, my emotional growth as an artist. So when I came back from Pilchuck, um, we reorganized my, art, my uh, artist studio based on the prof professional nature that I witnessed out, out at Pilchuck. And you know, in the morning I would get up and we'd go down to the hot shop because Bill was renting the hot shop and I'd drink a cup of coffee and watch Shelly and Rick and Bill and, um, oh, was it R Richard was there? Um, Ross? Ran Ross? Randy, Ross, Richmond. Ross, Richmond. Karen Willenbrink. Yeah, and just, and we, we called you the action figures. You know, we would watch the action figures full of glass. It was like super fun. Um, so, I got to go home and structure my, my personal studio based on what I witnessed up at Pilchuck. And, um, and my uh, professional career, I was a dressmaker. So my, my work is, is based on in my, my experience as a dressmaker and my understanding of taking flat sheets of, of material, and in this case it's sheet glass, and giving it form and structure. Hi everybody, I'm Shelley Muslowski allen and thank you Habitat for having us here. Thank you all for being here too. 
Um, I come from a fine art background also. Uh, I studied painting in Intaglio, and I was always unsatisfied with it. I would paint, and then I'd have to go get on my bicycle and ride my bike around the city. I had to, there was something that was really lacking with it. Um, an associate from my day job came to see my paintings one night, and she said, uh, you know, you should really be working in glass. And I thought that was just the most absurd thing I had heard because I knew nothing about glass. I only knew you could make perfume bottles, uh, wine glasses. And I thought, why the heck would I want to do that? Um, but she handed me a Pilchuck catalog. I applied. I went. Um, during the session I was there, uh, I met William Morris. I met Karen Willenbrink, the people that Susan just mentioned. And we became instant friends. And I was instantly in love with the material. And... Uh, I'm definitely not unsatisfied anymore working with glass. It is, it's just so, it fills all of my senses um, and uh, it challenges me so much every day. Uh, so I really, um, because it's such a, I feel so fully involved with glass and, and glass blowing takes such focus, I like to work with just what is, what is innately um, me, like what my experience is. Uh, what I see, what I imagine, um, you know, I work with animal forms, what I imagine they're doing, they're thinking, um, scenarios in which they're placed in. Uh, and I live very rurally, so I have a lot of subject matters to, to look at. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm so grateful that I have found glass, and uh, I got to work with such amazing people and meet all of these wonderful artists, too. Thank you. Hi there, my name's Jenny Pullman, and I collaborate with Sabrina Knowles. We've been collaborating for about 29 years, and she sends her regards. She was unable to accompany me on this trip. Uh, thanks, as Shelley said, to Habitat and for all of you for being here. Um, oh, I'm supposed to say why I got in glass. Okay. Uh, I identify as a poet, I always have, and to appease my parents, I pursued journalism in college. So I am a journalism major. Uh, I also have the good fortune of being cousins with Karen Willenbrink Johnson. So we were in college together and she pursued glass blowing and that's how I learned about glass as a material. I had no interest in the material at the time. I was a writer and a poet. Um, however, after a short stint uh, in the New York area in um, kind of journalism related business, I fled and found myself at Pilchuck Glass School where I met, Karen was working there, and I met Sabrina Knowles. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I, I uh, fell in love with glass. Sabrina did soft, uh, curved, feminine forms sculpture, and I'm a carpenter's daughter, so I believed in building. Uh, but my first summer at Pilchuck Glass School, when I learned you could core drill a hole in a sheet of very thick glass, I became extremely enthused, realizing that I could begin to assemble. Um, Sabrina and I got a studio in 1992 together, and we were not collaborating at the time, but we quickly found we were looking over each other's shoulder, even though we had opposing aesthetics. She uh, liked shiny, clear glass, gold leaf, black, a little bit of Rococo, and I was interested in collecting railroad spikes and tree lichen. So we found ourselves blending the two. We made our first collaborative piece for uh, an auction at a local art exhibition. It did really well. We really enjoyed working with each other, and we decided to pursue that. After about two years of working together and pursuing our independent work, we finally realized that we were going to go full gangsters into the collaboration, and that would have been around 1995, 6. Um, and that is how I became interested in glass. So I like to say Karen introduced me to glass, and Sabrina helped me fall in love with glass. <laughs> It was actually oh, I, it was kind of a two-part question um, because I was wondering if you saw any differences between artists that are female working in glass and artists who are um, uh, males working in glass. Does anybody want to try that? <laughs> I will. Sure. Okay. You will? Okay. I will. Um, I, I, 
thought about this question for since you sent it to us a week ago, and uh, I tried to look at all of the glass without knowing who made it, and um, and then uh, come to a conclusion without being too, you know, stereotypical of genders. But um, I think that when you listen to the four of us talk about where our work comes from, it's just all very. Um, pretty internal work, and uh, uh, there's a, a lot of sensitivity, subtle sensitivities, and a, also a, a subtle sensitivity with color also. Um, so I think that all of us here make work that's quite, um, I know it's more, more of a focus on details, like the, the focus on the details are as important as the whole form, um, which I think is just maybe very much how a woman's mind works. Uh, we have our feelers out all over the place all the time, whereas I think that men are a little bit more direct and maybe that shows up more in form because it's, you know, I've made this, here it is, and uh, uh, it's very powerful and fantastic work and in no way am I saying one is better than the other, but I do believe there is a difference. I, I find that uh, women's work can be more narrative and um, uh, stir more emotion, perhaps. And I find that most of us here work in, in mixed media. So um, it, it's, it's like whatever, whatever objects it takes to get our, our end story to you um, is, you know, is okay, you know. I don't remember reading this question, so I'm just winging it here. But um, <laughs> I actually, if I were to say most people that don't know who I am, they think that the work is made from a man. Like, they think my work is, is, um, is not from a woman. So I thought about that, and I thought, wow, okay. Um, so if I were to answer this, I would say probably for me it's more just about the internal dialogue of what, what is the artist trying to communicate and what are they trying to say really with their work. So I feel like it's so individual and I don't see necessarily the differences between um, men's and women's work in the sense of when I look at it I just look at the communication and what is it saying to me. Um, I agree that uh, a lot of the work that women create uh, has layers of detail, varying layers of detail. Um, but I also think that uh, the narrative nature, I think there was a panel similar to this about 15 years ago, and uh, the women concurred, and so did the audience, that the women's work was definitely more narrative driven with an intent to communicate a story as opposed to you know, a distinct form uh, to provoke emotion. But I do think that as more and more women have joined the community of artists working in glass, we have influenced the male thought process. And that I see a lot of work by men that also is uh, mixed media with layers of detail uh, articulating transitions and and such so I like to think that we ladies have had an influence on how uh, all artists look at the material yeah. good that's very good yeah I, and I have to agree with all of you because uh, there is a slight difference you know when we set the exhibit up it looked like I couldn't tell who was in Aquatica and who was in, because, uh, you know, there was, there was strong work in both of them, but you're right about the narrative and the detail. Very, yeah, very important. One other question. Um, do you ever, have you ever in your careers felt um, there was some prejudice, prejudice from peers or from collectors, museums, in, uh, uh, concerning uh, being uh, female? 
I'm sure that, uh, well, Sabrina reminded me that if there's discrimination against women anywhere, there's discrimination against women everywhere. And all of us can say that about something or other. Um, certainly, I'm sure that at times, perhaps, Sabrina and I were discriminated against. But in all honesty, we were so busy focusing on how to evolve our skills and, and fine tune our voice that there might have been a barb or a sting, but we didn't really linger on it. We didn't really try to go into, was that because I'm tall or because I'm a girl or because I'm with you? Or So we just kind of let it roll um, off our backs. Um, and I will say that as I thought about it, I thought I, I certainly don't want to dwell on any negativity because everything is really, you know, we're, we're here for a celebration of life. We've been through so many difficult things through the years, um, the last couple years. But I was left with a reminder that when I was a young artist trying very hard to uh, be recognized, I did feel that not from a gallery perspective or even a peer perspective, uh, but from a community perspective, it seemed that my male counterparts got much more uh, assistance from community members and perhaps accolades. Um, you know, for example, you would hear that so-and-so, somebody was doing a, a video, a two-minute video for them, pro bono. I had to look that word up. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. The reason I even say this is because for all of you, when you go out in the world and if you find an artist that you like, regardless of gender, um, whether it's their work you like or their moral character, because sometimes you don't like the work till you meet the person, then you realize the work is really something, you see more depth. Um, think about helping them to be recognized because the only way with a material as expensive as glass to really pursue your vision and bring it to maturation is to have that kind of support through uh, promotion and the purchase of artwork. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> that was really well said. Yeah, really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I completely agree with, with Jenny on the keeping your, you know, as a woman to make an impact um, I mean, we're all roughly the same age bracket that we had to so had to keep. Shelly, thank you. Keeping our head down and working really hard was really, I mean, uh, the way to make it in any area in life. That's what you have to do. You just have to work really hard and not let other things uh, stray you from your path. Um, I worked in the hot shop, and that was super male-dominated, but I was so in love with the material that I didn't care. I just, I, I would just, I would just, like, jump in there and help, and, and finally people realized, like, okay, she's crazy, just let her work, you know, just don't, don't um, uh, ask her to leave the hot shop. I mean, I, I had been asked to leave the hot shop because I was only supposed to be there for inspiration. Um, <laughs> Like not to work, yeah, like a, like a cheerleader, yeah, but, but um, you know, I think, I think all of that has changed drastically, and, uh, and, and honestly, there is never, I don't have any, like, negative memory or anything about the path taken. Uh, when I went to Murano to work with Davide, I had so many people tell me, you're not going to be able to sit at the bench, you're just going to sit there and you're going to draw, and they'll, all of the Italians will make the work that you want to make. And I said, you know, I'm going there, I'm going to sit at a bench, I'm going to make the work. And I walked into that hot shop and I was treated with utmost respect. I had a bench, I had my own glory hole, and I, anything I wanted. I had somebody bringing espressos all day long. Um, it was, you know, really, I think that, um, I think that maybe we end up, you know, p putting too much thought on what's going to constrain us. Uh, rather than just you know pushing through with things because when people realize that you really whoever you are male or female uh, are super passionate about something um, I think that people just naturally want to help or join in or you know it's just it becomes a, a more of a, of a celebration for everybody when that creative um, activity can keep happening so yeah I, I, I think it's been a tough long path but I loved every minute of it, and I still do. I, I think the, um, 
I guess the restrictions that I have had have been less about gender and more about um, my location as an artist. I'm in Missouri. So the next um, nearest glass uh, facility to me is in St. Louis, which is two hours away. Um, so for the most part, I, I work in isolation and I have a, um, I, I have a private studio and um, I haven't had an assistant now for a few years because COVID ruins everything. And so, um, so I was never aware, since I'm a, a kiln caster, I was never aware of the hot shop dynamic. Mm -hmm. And my first experience was at the hot shop was watching, you know, the you and the, yeah, the action, <laughs> you know. And, you know, you all had your, um, your talents in the hot shop and all brought it together to create this beautiful object that, you know, I was not aware that there was a male-female you know, dynamic that went on. Um, so I don't, if I've ever been discriminated against as a woman, I have not been aware of it. You know, it, it would have had to happen behind my back. <laughs> um, so, and my interaction with gallery owners, I feel like, you know, have been completely embraced in the Habitat family, and I've only, only been with you guys for about eight years. You know, many of your artists have been with you for decades. Um, so it, it's been a very good experience for me in the glass environment, and then, you know, coming to the shows, and, you know, it's like a family reunion. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that I don't have too much more to contribute. Um, I feel the same way as everybody else that has spoken. Um, when I was a, a student at Tulane, or the graduate student, I would say I was just bumbling and figuring out how to glass flow and just figuring it out. And, you know, the only thing I would say is, you know, people can be supportive people. You know, I wouldn't say like male, female. I think it's just everybody. So I, I do remember a graduate student and he was a little bit critical of things and but then I didn't really care I guess is the, the way I would say it is just I didn't you know was it because I was a woman was it because I was getting some good feedback from my professor was it that he was just that way <laughs> so you know I, I didn't really think about it much like it's because I'm a woman or anything like that but I just look at that as an example of just sort of life. It's, you could give that credit and you could give him credit and you could stop and just say, okay, I'm intimidated. Because I was pretty intimidated to go in the glass department and I could just sort of retract, recoil and just say it's, it's just too hard, right? Um, when I was trying to find a facility to do my work because I really, once I learned the technique at Tulane, it was like, that's it this is my life and this is what I want to do. And it took about a decade to actually find a place to do it. I found a, a gentleman that I really liked and I, I went up to him and I was 22 or something. And I said, you know, it's a glass blower studio. Um, I'm sand casting and I explained what that was. He wasn't really familiar with it, but he was very negative. You know, he was like, I don't want you messing up my equipment. You're gonna make a mess. You're gonna take up my annealers for a week or two? No, thank you. And I just kept showing up, and I just kept coming back. And I was, you know, I never thought it was because I'm a woman. I'm a woman, and maybe he thinks that I'm, you know, not strong enough or not serious or professional or whatever. I just like knew this was what I wanted to do with my life. So I just kept coming back, and I just kept saying like, okay, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Came up with some money. Like, okay, you have to come up with this amount of money and I'll build you, you know, a furnace and, and it just was unrealistic, you know, in my 20s that I could ever come up with that money, but I saved my money and, you know, so it's just, I think, like what you said is just that it was persistence and I just kept going and it just was, I, I, all I wanted to do was that and so I didn't really care what people said, I just was going for it. You know, listening to everyone, it's, you know, um, kind of the head 
down and plow through and get it done. <laughs> you know, it, it just made me realize that um, a career in art is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> you know, you just, and, and there's so many moments where, you know, and especially halfway through a project, you know, if I'm with, with an assistant or a, a young artist, I have to remind them constantly that everything looks like shit halfway through. I mean, if, you know, if you stop halfway through, you're not giving yourself a fair chance. <laughs> so you just have to plow through, and it's, it's a lot of that. And, you know, if, if you're a timid person, you're, you just, you're not going to get this far. You just can't. So, yay us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Very impressive. Thank you. And I was wondering if there's any questions from the audience. So my oh, question here. is, you all are uh, similar to the same age, and um, so did any of the uh, women's the women's movement of the latter part of the 20th century have any influence on you with that grit and that determination just to see it through? I mean, do you I, at Sitting in 2022, you know, 2022, it's hard to remember back in the 70s and 80s really what was happening for women. So I'm and I'm just wondering if if you thought that through or what that impact had so that you could move forward in a career. You know, with the the recent Me Too movement, um, it, it did did make me reflect and. Um, back to when I was a young woman. And, you know, at that time I thought, oh, this is just the way men are. And, you know, you don't, personally, it's like that's the, just the way men are and this is just the way I am. Um, but, you know, reflecting back more recently, it's like, yeah, that's the way men are, but maybe that wasn't the way men should have been. <laughs> you know? so, so um, I guess that was that was my revelation. It really it didn't change my work at all, but it made me realize that um, you know how I how I was reflecting upon men as a young woman is definitely different um, now as as a mature person. <laughs> <laughs> Are you about to do it? Sorry, can you go ahead? No, I no, really haven't. Hot topic. Um, I, through the 70s and 80s, I was mostly a student. Uh, so I have that perspective of, with, um, you know, being a female student, uh, the marking system was a little different, um, that kind of, which, and so when I thought to uh, the women's movement, I was, I mean, I was super grateful for it, but I wasn't directly involved with it because I was in, in school, but there were definitely were situations that needed to be remedied, and they were um, within the 80s, like the 1980s, that certain situations were corrected due to that movement, and so I am, you know, very grateful for those brave women to start it all off, and, um, and then again, with the most recent Me Too, um, that caused me to reflect on a lot of situations uh, that happened throughout my life that I never really realized. Um, it didn't. I didn't allow myself to dwell on it. I guess, but I've gone back and I've realized that certain situations happened because of you know just a lack of awareness that we all have now. And I and I'm very happy for the women of the younger women of of now. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, certainly we all stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. You know, you go through the forest with uh, just starlight, and then you find a way to make fire, and the next thing you know, you've got, you know, halogen headlight beams, and the path just keeps getting wider. So all of us are here because of what our foremothers and sisters, etc., cetera, did. Um, and I look forward to... I think probably the greatest marker for me of the uh, advancements that we've made as a society, uh, meaning all men and all women together in unison, uh, is the strength and grace of the younger generations of women coming up and the um, athletic opportunities or uh, 
the example these young women are giving us is refueling me as an older woman now because you know you push the ball so far and then you you're bound to get tired you know and it's usually about 50 to 60. <laughs> so 50 to 60 I was super tired and now all of a sudden I'm on fire and I really attribute that to what I see going on in our culture in our society driven by women but men too men who support them um, and I think maybe that was all I wanted to say. <laughs> oh, I did want to say one thing. There was a little bit of rub when we were all girls in that girl athletes were not given the respect that they should have been given. And, you know, these young female athletes who just put their head down and just kept going, and now you notice you open the sports page, there's a lot of accolades for these female teams and everything. So this is just all good signs of... Uh, egalitarianism advancing. You know, I would probably agree with you, Jenny, is that I, I feel, you know, growing up in the 80s, um, you know, we did have more opportunities because of, you know, the women before us. And sports, I would say, I was very fortunate to have equal opportunities really good sports, leadership capabilities, um, and I think that that really helped a lot of, of who I am today is the opportunities that I was given to persevere, move forward, lead, and those were through sports actually, women's sports, and um, you know, thinking about it when you just said that, it wasn't always that way, but those opportunities I really feel like when you end up um, in a glass blowing class and it's a team activity and you have to get help because of my size and stature. If I want to do something big, I, I need help. So it, it is such a community activity working in glass and I think we all have to work together. And I personally have not found um, you know, any sort of difficulty in getting help from men or otherwise I feel that like you were saying you just you want to Shelly you just want to help and you want to do things and then you get that back people want to help you so men or women I think it's it's been we've been lucky actually because of what came before us you know so I'm standing close to the group here because I keep saying that, you know, we're all about similar age. <laughs> uh, I think you, I'm sure you met me. <laughs> Was there any other questions? I have one more. If there's not. Uh, there's one question back there, and then we'll get to you, Jane. Yes. A microphone's coming to you. My question is for young women who are thinking about a uh, career in art or obviously in glass. Um, how would you advise them? How do you how do you advise the work, the money, the grit, all that kind of thing? What would you tell them to think about? It's a long answer, but I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I think it has a lot to do with sort of the, th the things I was saying. It's like if you find something that you're passionate about. I think it's, um, you know, you have to figure it out. I mean, uh, if you want to do that. It's just a question of perseverance and, um, of course, finding your voice is, I feel like, the first thing that school really enables you to, to, to focus in on. There's no, there's no commercial thought when you're in school, and I love that, you know, on the one hand. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, where I feel like I would have been benefited if, if I took some business classes. Because the reality is, is we're running a business. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I hate to be so bold to say that, but as artists today, I feel, you know, there's the creative side, but there has to be some sort of a managing of, of the the business side and I wish I had that you know so I'm sort of bumbling through that I think SCAD does today they do teach business classes and you know because you're not you're not concerned about the commercial side of it when you're in school but if you do want to make a career out of it it's um, 
it's really essential. Marketing, a marketing class, oh my gosh. <laughs> if I had that, you know, if I had, I'm just trying to think what else would have really helped me. Business Accounting, management. business management, all of that, you know, because I, I was in the dark, you know, like, I have no idea how to survive, but I figured it out. I definitely figured it out for some reason. <laughs> um, so that, that's what I would say, more business classes. I think for me, you know, besides just having a, a pit bull personality where, you know, I took hold and I wasn't going to let go, um, I think uh, my husband, you know, cho choosing the right partner um, who will su support you, you know, emotionally and sometimes financially because this is not a, a cheap way to make a living for sure. Um, you know, my husband's not an art guy, but um, he's completely supportive and, um, you know, I, it, one person can't do this, you know, and, um, and then I thought, well, my husband and I can do this, and then I realized I need an assistant, and then, you know, and then an accountant, and, you know, so, it, it, uh, you have to, yeah, it takes a village for sure to be able to do this. But, um, you know, if, if I had picked any other person to share my life with, I may not have, I may not be here. Yeah, because he, you know, he's had his head down and plowing ahead too, so. Um, yeah, I think I would say very much that, that you have to imagine your life wearing many hats uh, it's it is a, you're self-employed as an artist, so you do have to imagine yourself doing all of the steps. Um, and then as you move along with your career, you can't be afraid to ask for help either when you want and and allow um, you know your your what you are striving to make to um, to not be able to realize that because you can't do it all on your own whether it be it's you know too large scale um, or you need you know just additional hands uh, but I absolutely would encourage a young person to go into uh, you know to follow their passion especially if it is glass um, and just find a way to you know whether it be assisting somebody in their studio um, to just get your your footing uh, it's definitely a, well it's wonderful it's it's so multifaceted being in this, working with this medium. And uh, uh, I think that they should absolutely be encouraged to continue. I concur with um, everything said. And I would add that uh, I think if you know of some young women who are thinking about a career in glass, you could advise them to seek out a mentor uh, the glass community at large is very generous with their knowledge and uh, regardless of gender people share information and labor um, so I would think anyone on this panel would be able to if nothing else field some questions for any young people um, I would also say seek out uh, scholarship opportunities at organizations around the country I know in Seattle where Shelly and I are based she's a little bit north but um, there is a wonderful Pratt Fine Arts Center and then, of course, the uh, monumental Pilchuck Glass School. But all of these organizations, and there are many throughout the country, offer scholarship opportunities uh, for young people. So, uh, And the, the perfect partner is most definitely the perfect antidote, as, as we all know. <laughs> Oh, as a, oh, I, I just oh. have one more, one more comment. As, as a young artist, when I talk to young artists, I'm like, okay, imagine, imagine creating the artwork, and then photographing the artwork, and then packing the artwork, and shipping the artwork, and then making a website, and then traveling to shows. I mean, you, um, as an artist, you have to be um, mentally ready to do everything. And Talk filing tax returns. Filing tax returns. <laughs> oh yes. T talking about your work because I, you know, for the first five years, my work was supposed to speak for itself. You know, so, <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, just uh, and I think that's where the the artist's fortitude comes in is 
um, realizing that you may have to wear all those hats. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is um, another thing I think if you have somebody in mind is an apprenticeship in not only, I don't think it's necessarily about learning the work because usually if somebody is artistic, you know, they probably have found what they want to do. You know, that's fine tuning. But I've had some, some young kids come in and just actually apprentice under, you know, like what the business is, like you say, like, okay, how do we do a website? This is how I, you know, get ready for a show. This is, you have to photo, like if, Somebody told me, you don't just photograph your work on the grass. You know, you have to get and spend the money. Just spend it on a professional photographer. If somebody had told me that, you know, it's just simple, stupid stuff like that, that, you know, people will take you seriously. If it's on a white background, it's going to stand out. If you're in a sea of competition with, you know, all these other artists for being an international, how do you get the gallery to want you? How do they even like notice you? So all of those things that you're just not necessarily taught in school. So, you know, ask an artist like one of us. I would love a kid to come and, and work under and see what I'm doing and see what's successful. And I mean, I have 30 years to, to tell them that and I'm very happy to share that. So I think an apprenticeship is a really like in in work, you know, they do internships, and why not with a, a glass artist that's willing to do that and share their knowledge? And like Jenny said, we're all very willing to share because there should be more artists out there. You know, we love what artists create, whether it be films or music or visual arts. It's like the world's a better place, so why not help? I'm going to thank all of you for doing a wonderful job. Thank you. And thank you all for